Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted today to be joined by Sarah Stites. Sarah is in Armenia and is uh, doing work for Caritas Aragat Foundation, which is working with uh, children with special educational needs. Uh, delighted to have you with us. It's great to be hearing about people's stories from other parts of the world to know what's going on to include uh, disabled people and 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 really very interested to hear about your story and what you're doing. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background? And obviously talking to you, you don't sound terribly Eastern European. So a bit of backstory as well, please. Sure, of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm also delighted to be here. Um, so yeah, we'll start with my background. I am a quarter Armenian. So I have a little bit of it in my blood. Um, but I did recently become a dual citizen, so I'm an Armenian as well as American citizen. Um, my grandfather was a full Armenian, but I never met him. He died long before I was born, and so that really inspired me to want to explore my roots. And um, so I found a program called Birthright Armenia, and the goal of this program was to bring young people whose ancestors were from Armenia, but had fled during the genocide in um, 1915 and bring them back to their homeland. And so I did this program in 2018 and part of the program included um, volunteering and I was placed at the organization where I now work. I loved it so much that I decided to stay. So that's a little bit about my background. That's fantastic. And so tell us a bit more about the about the foundation that you now work for. Mm -hmm. So um, Caritas Aragak Foundation runs two different organizations. The first is called the Emily Aragak Center, and we are a support and development center for kids with special needs in Gyumri, Armenia. And Gyumri, just a little bit about Gyumri, it is the second biggest city in Armenia. And probably the most notable thing to be aware of is that Gyumri experienced a huge earthquake in 1988. And prior to that earthquake, it was the cultural hub of Armenia. It was a successful city. There were many factories, but nearly all of the factories collapsed and the population was decimated and the city never really returned to what it was like before. And so the poverty rates are very high here the population of people with disabilities is higher because many people, of course, sustained injuries after the earthquake. Um, the economy is very bad as well. So really, my organization meets a big need. And the way we think about it is that, you know, we want to support families who have special needs kids and make their lives easier, um, help them on that journey because unfortunately many families with special needs kids also do give up those children to orphanages because life is so hard in Armenia. Okay. So um, that is a little bit about our, um, our center. I can talk now about our bakery. Maybe we can get to that later. However you guys want to approach it. So, so um, of course, I, I'm still sort of digesting the, 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 the uh, the, the, the description that you just gave about people you know finding life so tough that they have to give away their their children and and uh, it it obviously is heart-wrenching because it doesn't you know when when people are forced to do that it's obviously not because they don't love their children so right. um describe a little bit about the sort of economic situation in in armenia because people you know may not know um obviously it's a former soviet republic and is right. now independent and but yeah. but yeah it would be it would be good for people to sort of understand a bit of the context um as to why it's it's such a struggle etc aside from the you know the the natural destruction that's been wrought as well of course yeah so of course the collapse of the soviet union happened shortly after this earthquake and then there was also a war in armenia around that time mm -hmm. so really Everything happened at once and Gyumri got the brunt of it. And so right now, um, work is just the lack is the biggest problem in the city. So one really eye-opening fact that I'll share with you is that 
mm, I couldn't give you the exact percentage, but at least half of the adult male population, if not more, works in Russia and sends home remittances to the families. Mm, okay. There are many cases where they will stay in Russia and not send back money to the families. Um, so that is one of the biggest issues that the families are broken up because of this, because there's no work in the city. Um, and then uh, also special needs families, you know, face higher rates of family breakup in general, and that is exacerbated here. Um, so another factor, a sad factor to mention too, is that there is still very high stigma against people with disabilities in Armenia. And we, of course, are working to change that. There are many great organizations working to change that. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly why that is, but one of my theories is that because of the culture here, children are expected to help um, with family finances, you know, to, to, to eventually work and contribute to supporting the family and eventually to support elderly parents. And so a child with disabilities is considered non-viable um, and a shame on the family. And I've heard of cases where children were sent to orphanages because the parents were afraid that, you know, they would be looked down upon by their neighbors or that other families wouldn't, for example, if another family had a daughter who wanted to marry into this family, maybe they wouldn't because they think that disability runs in, in the genetics of the family. There, there are a lot of these different kind of theories and thoughts um, surrounding this. And again, we're, I think education is key and that's part of also what we do, um, trying to change perspectives on this. Uh, Sarah, can, can you uh, describe us uh, the the type of support that families uh, of these children uh, might expect uh, in Armenia? So you work for an organization, but what uh, is there other organizations working in the field? Uh, what is the relation with, with government at the education level, at social services? Can you give us a picture of that? Yeah, so inclusive education started about 20 years ago. But one of the big problems was that it was really inclusive in name only. And there was a, you know, there was a push to change things, but not a proper foundation laid for doing so. So teachers didn't receive the right um, education and preparation for it. Children with disabilities were just mixed into classrooms. Um, there aren't the appropriate support structures. So many families just chose not to send their kids to those schools because it wasn't working. So gradually that is changing. Um, there's also support. I, I think right now, every family with a child, a registered child with disabilities receives about 50 USD a month. Uh, salaries are very low in Armenia, I am, but I can tell you that that doesn't go very far to help a family because of course, the infrastructure in this city as well is inaccessible. There aren't accessible transportation options. Most of the sidewalks don't have ramps. Um, a lot of the roads are gravel. Um, there aren't elevators in, in apartment buildings and most everyone lives in an apartment. So there are just a lot of obstacles facing these families. Sometimes going along with the stigma piece that I mentioned earlier, a family may not want to take their child to receive medical services, which the government will help subsidize because again, they're afraid of the stigma and the shame. They don't want to acknowledge they're in denial that their child has special needs. So that's a little bit an answer to your question. Um, I would say what makes us different, you know, the, the services we provide of course are completely free. And I would also say that the most beautiful thing about our center really is well, twofold, the love that's in our center and also the way that it is laid out. We were very blessed to receive donations from the Austrians, um, several different organizations and personal donors gave money to create our center. I wish I could give you a tour now and I can actually, if you guys want, I can take the computer around and show you. Um, but it we is- We love it. No, we will share, we will share the link uh, okay. in, in, in uh, when we uh, 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 when during the, the period that we're going to to promote our presence on, on access chat 
because you have that view on your site. Oh, okay, yes. Good. Um, this, this wood is all uh, alpine wood. So the whole center, basically, all the materials were transported from Austria. And so it is intentionally built to provide a sense of peace and calm and nature and space. And in Gimri, what a juxtaposition, because really when you come down the street toward our center, you have these post-Soviet concrete apartment buildings and you know gravelly roads. And it's just a kind of depressing view. And you turn the corner and there's our building, wood, glass, solar panels. And um, families routinely will tell me, yeah, the first time I stepped into your building, I just felt it was different. I felt like I let all my stress go. And um, so I'm getting carried away, but we, um, you know, the services that we, we provide include a full range of therapies, physical, speech, ergo, music, art, um, psychological therapy. Um, and they're both individual uh, groups, um, sorry, there are individual um, therapy sessions as well as group therapy sessions and activities. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop. If you guys have questions, I will answer them. Well, I, um, I, I, I was blessed to interview you on my other show, Human Potential at Work. And I just was blown away by just multiple things. Uh, th what the people are having to walk breaks my heart so bad. And of course, COVID's happening. So I want you to address that a little bit. But I also, uh, I'm so, <clears throat> and I want you to tell us the story about the bakery because there were some surprises about the bakery. Y'all were worried, for example, that you know, if the bakery is being made for, by people with disabilities, will it be accepted? And, and that part of the story I thought was really beautiful. But I also, um, I look at young, amazing people like you, Sarah, and, and you give me hope for the world because you left the U.S. that we, I mean, things are messy in the U.S. right now, but things are very, you know, comparatively, it's, I just think it says so much about your generation as we find leaders, young leaders like you that are like, well, no, wait a minute. How can I honor my culture? And I just think there's so much beauty surrounding your story and what is happening to the city because of the efforts that you're making. And God bless the Austrians. God bless the Austrians for helping because we should all be helping. We should all be helping. But so I was wondering if you, and once again, I know a little bit more about this story just a little bit and I love the story um, and I love who you are but I was just wondering if you would talk about those parts of the story. Sure sure so first yeah first I'll address the, the country situation and how it's affected our work and you might remember Deborah that not only did we battle COVID in 2020 but we also had a war and yes. this war started in September and ended in November and we lost over 4,000 young men um, and there are, of course, many young men who are also now sustaining disabilities and injuries. So one thing I'd like to share, which is um, sad, but, you know, again, we're doing what we can. Um, we've initiated a couple new projects because we have this wonderful center and we have a really professional team with skill sets that are applicable to this aftermath of the war. And so we've started two new projects. One is a psychosocial support program for families of war victims. And that was inspired because we had um, a young girl with autism who attended our center and her father was killed in combat. And um, her mother was a volunteer with us here. And so we saw how this was also affecting our people, our beneficiaries. And so, we're now working with families um, to help them navigate psychologically um, the trauma that they faced. And in the spring, we will be starting a, um, we're fundraising right now for it, um, a rehabilitative therapeutic program for disabled soldiers because our therapists proposed this to our administrative team and said, we wanna help after our work hours with the kids we want to use our expertise and our space to help the soldiers through physical therapy, speech therapy, and psychological support. 
So um, Sarah, Sarah, I, I'm just going to interrupt one second. Yeah. Make sure that we have a link to that fundraiser, please. When you send the information okay. to Antonio, because we want to yeah. make sure our audience, I think nobody's going to hear this story and not be touched by it because we're all working so hard to include people with disabilities, but just everything, how everything's unfolding. Um, yeah. It's a very powerful story. So excuse me for that. I will. I will. I will include that. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, on, on, on that note, I will say that while 2020 was definitely a challenge at the beginning because of COVID, really COVID was completely eclipsed by the war. And so right now, really the country is just trying to survive. The economy is shot because of both the war and COVID. So our kids are still coming to the center. Um, you know, we take everyone's temperature when they come in and we have hand sanitizer, of course, it's not very practical to have the kids wear masks because, you know, many children with special needs can't handle that. Um, but thankfully things are going okay. And we, we I mean, we also know it's a, it's a trade-off. If, if these children stay at home, again, because our community is not accessible, can't even really get out of the house. Um, and that is very detrimental psychologically and emotionally to them. So we're trying to just, you know, keep having them come here and be smart and wise about how we do it. And thank God it's been okay thus far. And also y'all feed the children and the, you know, a lot of these yeah. families, I mean, just little things that maybe we don't think of, but Absolutely. the reality is if they didn't come, they might not eat too. So. Uh, you make a, you make a great point. Thank you for reminding me of that two, twofold here. The winter in Yumri is brutal. I can tell you. Um, and many of these families struggle to just heat their homes. Gas is wildly expensive compared to people's salaries. And so our center is warm and they are fed here. That's a huge thing for these families to know that, okay, my child at least has this one square meal in the day and will be warm from this hour to this hour. Um, so yes, that is another huge, huge uh, service that we provide. Um, so I will move to the bakery unless you guys have any. Well, yeah, yes. okay. yeah, we want you to move to the bakery, but also um, after the bakery, we want you just to talk a little bit about why you would do this, Sarah, because this is, you know, yeah. the, I think that's an important part of it, but go ahead, please tell us sure. about the bakery because that's sure. this part of it. So um, I, I have next to me here, this is our, I don't know if you guys can see it, but this was the grand opening day of our bakery. Okay. Um, and so what was thrilling for me is that the center has been around, you know, for, for a while before I came, but the bakery opened three months after I arrived in Armenia. So I got to play a huge role in the um, PR and communications and marketing build up toward it. And so it's really, you know, it's kind of the same age as I as my time in Armenia. So it's very near and dear to my heart. And um, I was just there yesterday and my favorite leader, a young man named Hovo with Down syndrome, he, um, it was his 28th birthday. And um, I always say that that guy's hugs, you're supposed to have seven hugs a day to fill your quota, but one of his hugs fills your quota <laughs> for the week. <laughs> um, He's a delight, but I should move back and say, the reason we opened this bakery is because we had a problem where we saw that our center was serving youth up to the graduation age of 18, 19. And after they left our center, again, there was no work. There, there's not work for completely abled people. There was no work for people with disabilities, nothing for them to do. And so we ended up getting a grant from the European Union to do a project that involved a training component as well as money to actually construct, to renovate an old a building and turn it into Armenia's first inclusive bakery and cafe, Aragog Bakery. And um, our mission is to provide employment opportunities for young adults with special needs as well as moms of kids with disabilities who also face obstacles to entrance to the work, um, to the labor market. So um, I, I just am always so full of joy whenever I talk about this place because it really is the sunniest, the warmest corner in Gumri. People love coming there because 
first of all, our pastries and our bread and our coffees are really top notch. They're very high quality, but also just because of the atmosphere, it's such a warm place to be. And people love Hobo, the, the young man I mentioned before. I mean, he, he brings their pastries and coffee with this huge smile and such joy. And Hobo really taught me an important lesson. And that is that People, I always knew that people with special needs and with disabilities, of course, could work and of course have skills, but I never really understood the reality that they have unique skill sets, meaning, for example, that Hovo is a better waiter than I could be. I'm a classically abled person, but I couldn't have the joy that Hovo has and the delight that he takes in his work. I just couldn't display that in the same way. And so he's he makes an excellent waiter. And our, our young um, barista, Grisha, with cerebral palsy, he too exhibits that sort of joy in his work. And he is so honored to have work. He supports his, both of these young men support their elderly parents with their paychecks and the dignity they feel in their work fills me up. This fills me up. I think this is great because you talked before about the the sort of very low expectations that people have of, of, of people who have disabilities or learning differences in Armenia. And, and, and essentially what you're doing is flipping that completely on its head and they're becoming the, the bread makers and the bread winners. And, exactly. Um, you know, that then is smashing stereotypes. So I think that's that's fantastic. I, I really love this model. I think it's it, it's it's really really nice. Exactly, so. exactly. I I wrote a piece about our bakery um, for the newspaper Armenian Weekly, and they came up with a great um, uh, Instagram caption for this for the story when they posted there. They said we were breaking bread and barriers, and um, it's true. And you also get, did a great one there, baking bread and winning bread, right? Bread, yeah. bread winners. Bread, exactly. bread, yeah, bread makers and... Bread makers and bread winners. I wrote it yeah, down. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you might want to use it in one of your campaigns. But yeah. I love the other one too, breaking bread and barriers. barriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, Neil, you're exactly right. Because of course, that is another one of our goals is to change stereotypes through having people just enter our bakery and see people with disabilities working, see the abilities of people with disabilities, right? That's mind blowing for people. My, my question goes exactly to that is from, from the, the, the period that you, are, that you are in Armenia and that you're working on that project, uh, how do you, uh, what observations have you made in relation to the impact in the local community? Yeah, that's a great question. So as Deborah touched on earlier, before we opened the bakery, we were actually concerned that people might not come to the bakery because of the fact that special needs uh, folks work there. And I'll give you a little anecdote to explain why. So we take our kids with special needs at the center, we take them to the pool in Gyumri and moms of other kids complained to the staff at the pool saying that they thought their kids would catch disabilities from our kids. So that was one of our concerns. We thought, well, if there's this fear that it's contagious, if there's this fear that these people are sick, and actually, I, I kid you not, the Armenian word, the kind of rude Armenian word that people use for, for um, special needs folks is, Ivan, which means sick in Armenian. So it kind of, you know, it's it's built into the culture to, to think that way. And especially very, um, the people outside of the capital, people in villages or smaller cities do have this notion. And so of course, slowly through education, we can change that. But at the beginning, we just thought, what's gonna happen? Are people not gonna come? But gradually people came. And I think it really helped that we had opinion leaders come. The president of Armenia came very, very early on. and. He had just such a warm relationship with our staff, especially our two young men with Down syndrome. And he you know, said such wonderful things about us. I think he helped change people's perspectives. And so right now I can tell you that on every platform where it's possible to rate us, we have five stars. We've never received anything less than five stars on Google My Business, 
on Facebook, on TripAdvisor. And yeah, people, I mean, look, people are compelled as well by the quality of our products. And that was another strategic decision we made. We didn't wanna just be any run of the mill bakery. We invested in training and we actually got a pro bono trainer, very highly qualified woman from Yerevan, the capital of Armenia to come and work with our staff and teach them. And we have high quality ingredients I say our pastries are the best in Armenia and I am biased, but I believe that, I really do. And so if people are not coming for the for our staff, they're coming for the pastries and slowly we're working on them. And I've, I've seen changes. I don't have proof, but I feel that. I, I, I sense that because of the growing popularity, the fact that people come from all around Armenia, people have heard about us and people see that it works. They just see it in action. We're a model. That's great. Such a such a, a, a powerful story, and with the addition of cake, which is one of my favourite things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm partial to the cake, um, so <laughs> and bread, yeah, yeah, anything doughy. Oh yes, <laughs> coffee, Armenian coffee, yummy. I want some right now. Oh, oh yeah, uh, uh, you're, you're getting me started. So. <laughs> Wow, yeah, no, that would be amazing. Um, goodness me. So do you have plans to roll this model out further? I mean, it sounds like what you're doing is, is great and also could be replicable. Obviously, you don't want to overstretch, but this, this seems like something where you could have bakeries in, in, in more than one town and, and be doing this and, and upending those assumptions around Armenia and, and, and that, you know, I, I, I can see how that would work really well. Yeah. Has the foundation yeah. got big plans? We do have big plans. We do. We have discussed opening a second branch of the bakery, but we want to do it in Gyumri. We want to have two in Gyumri. We want to have one focus more on catering. We want to expand our operations that way. One of the main reasons we don't want to have a branch in Yerevan in the capital is because really we are a sort of attraction bringing people from the capital to Gyumri. And we like it that way because one of the biggest issues is that there's a brain drain um, from Gyumri to Yerevan. Many of the talented young people move away from our city. And um, we just think Argak is something special that brings people here. But we also do have other plans. Um, I would like to open a business myself in Armenia. And I have a lot of different ideas. But whatever I do open, I for sure, for sure, am going to be employing young people with special needs who have graduated from our center and done our training courses. And I want to show that, yeah, that we can have multiple inclusive businesses and use this model. That's fantastic. Sarah. Sarah, going with what Neil said, sort of following Neil, what what are the number one thing, or what are some things y'all need right now? I know you mentioned that you're doing a fundraiser, so we'll definitely put that out there. But you know, our community is going to love this story. It's going to touch our so many hearts. Are there other things that our community can help you with? And by the way, this question is not just for today. Please come back to us and tell us as you advance and as you'll do other things and as you need more things, but are there any things communities could help you with right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Wow, what an offer. Well, two, two things come to mind besides the, the um, rehabilitative care project that I mentioned. So um, 2020 was the first year that the Armenian government actually supported our center through um, funding. We received a grant for our services for children with autism. But this year, um, we're not really sure why, but we did not get that grant um, this year. So we're a little bit in a lurch. Um, there's a possibility we might get it. I think they're reviewing, again, the applicants. So uh, we are looking to fundraise to, to, to fund that particular program. And then with the bakery, this is um, the one that I myself am most excited about and really working to fund is that um, our cellar in the bakery is currently unfinished. Um, it, it has a humidity problem and so we're unable to use it. And our bakery space is very small. 
Um, so having that extra space down there would be threefold. It would allow us to have more storage so we wouldn't have to go so frequently to Yerevan to get supplies. We could keep it all down there. Uh, the second is that we could expand our operations. I mentioned catering. That's something we really want to do is start doing events. Um, and so that would give us space to prepare catering in the basement. And then also our staff don't have any place to, to rest during their breaks. It's a very, very small space, a cramped kitchen. Um, and that has caused some problems in the past, especially with our special needs young adults, just not having the, the space um, that they need to, to be at peace. And so we need about $10,000 to renovate that space. Um, so yeah, those, those three things are on my mind in terms of um, fundraising. Okay, do you have a GoFundMe or, a, or, or any other sort of uh, direct fundraising campaign? You know, because there's all of these sort of ways that you can raise money on, on the web that we, you know, if we can tweet out links for, for that kind of stuff, you know, please feel yeah. free. To that, that would be great. One of the biggest issues is that a lot of those don't work from Armenia. Oh, um, okay. There are so many options. And because we are not yet, a, Deborah knows this, that hopefully this year we want to start a 501c3 equivalent of the Caritas Aragak Foundation so we can start using all of these amazing tools. Um, so yeah, GoFundMe, I think, could work, but it would have to be done through a personal account or through a different organization, and then the money would have to be transferred to us. No, I, I'm, I'm curious to say, we know that the uh, the purpose of your project really fits in some of the initiatives that the United Nations Sustainable Goals pretends to achieve. Uh, mm -hmm. What are, uh, are you doing any type of collaboration with any representatives of the UN in the region? Uh, have you applied for an award? What can you, what, what have you done in that space? Yeah, so um, in the past, we have worked with USAID, with the EU. We've applied for various grants from different embassies. Um, we work, as I mentioned, with a lot of Austrian foundations. Um, we work with some US-based foundations, but the UN really has not been on our radar recently. So thank you for that. I will explore um, what options they have. Awesome. So we're, we're pretty much at the end of our half an hour. It flies by as always. Uh, I think we're gonna have fun on, on Twitter. We've got some great topics to talk about. I just need to actually give our vote of thanks to the people that help keep us on air, keep us uh, virtually fed and watered, Barclays Access, Microlink, and, and My Clear Text for helping keep us captioned and accessible. Uh, so thank you very much, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure talking with you uh, and finding out about the work you're doing. It's really great work. Um, looking forward to, I hope, for a bright future for you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's my pleasure.